Hey everybody, Walter Crosby with Helix Sales Development, your host of Sales and Cigars. Today's episode is for anybody that owns a business. Anybody that owns a business. My guest is Lori Barkman. She, she got a great line early in the conversation. You are going to exit your business one way or the other. So let's listen to Lori and the ideas that you have to help you transition your business. And there are tons and tons of ways that you can do this. And she has so many opportunities for, or for you to learn about your business. She's got a great book. Her website is full of content, courses, um, one-on-ones, group sessions. So go grab a cigar, grab a cocktail, strap in for another fun episode of Sales and Cigars. Thanks. So, Lori, welcome to Sales and Cigars. I appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to have a chat. Hey, Walter. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Um, we met through mutual friend uh, Nick Hutchins, and um, I appreciate him recommending you to be uh, be a guest on the, on the program. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's He's connected to a lot of authors, and he knows who would make a great podcast guest. So there you go. And he's recommended a couple of people and everybody has been fun and entertaining. And I think we've added value to the audience. So, um, I, and your topic is something that's sort of a hot button with uh, a, a lot of conversations I have with business owners. So let's jump in. Um, I, I love to ask this question um, at the beginning. Is there a book that you, you gift a lot or that you reread yourself uh, aside from your own? Right. We'll talk about that. But is there is there one that kind of stands out for you? There's a book that I read in college that I've reread over the years, and it might surprise you. It's called The Tao of Pooh, and Pooh is Winnie the Pooh, P O O H, Winnie the Pooh. So the Tao of Pooh. So it's the Tao is a, Taoism is a religion. So T A O, and Winnie the Pooh is such a great character. He's so innocent, and how they these characters look at the world. And one of the characters in this particular story was the busy Baxon. The busy Baxon was never home. They were never home. They were never around. And Piglet and the characters always wanted to meet and talk with the busy Baxon. But the sign, ultimately, for readers like you and me, when we read it, what it really says is busy back soon. And what struck me and what has stuck with me all these years is that I know I've been a busy Baxon. I haven't been as present as I could be. Someone's talking to me. My mind is going a million miles an hour. That's a sign of a busy Baxon. And I have worked really hard, especially over the last five, 10 years to unwind some of those bad habits. And reading this book just reminds me that that that's something we probably all have tendencies to do is not really be present. And, um, it's hard, but I, I'm trying to be better at that. I don't want to be a busy Baxon. That's that's a that's a great that's a great uh, uh, analogy to pull out of that. Um, I, I mean, I watched Winnie the Pooh when I was a kid, um, and it, those you, those stories we can relate to children, teenagers, adults. Um, but that being present or slowing down, um, you know, whatever cliche, you know, stop, take time to smell the roses. Um, it, I think that's something that we all struggle with it to, to some point, um, you know, because everything is so fast paced. Um, I'm old. I remember uh, the speed of the speed of business was like FedEx. They could get you a package, a contract the next day. Right. That was pretty cool. And then the fax machine came along and, um, and now, like somebody sends you an email and they walk across the building, like you know, did they read you? Did you read my email? It's it's, it's crazy. We all need to chill out a little bit, I guess. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would pride myself on being the ultimate multitasker, and then I I look at my husband and he's like the opposite, right? He does one thing at a time. Now you could argue maybe that's a male female thing. I don't know. I just know that's how I am and how he is, but. Um, I realized over time, it's not good for me. You know, I used to think, oh, this is amazing. I can have all these things swirling in my head and all these checklists and, but it creates a lot of anxiety, creates stress. 
and why, you know, let's just focus, let's get things done that need to get done, focus on the most important things. And this is going to lead into our conversation today is how do we make time for these important things and identifying what they are and making time for them. Absolutely. All right. I love it. Um, so it, I want to go back to the book though, just for one last question. Like what, what made you pick that up in college? Right. Cause I, if I remember the book, it has like Winnie the Pooh on the cover, right? It does. Yeah, I think there was a, a book one and this was book two and <clears throat> book one I read and just it really inspired me. And I think this was book two. I can't remember the origin story of how I found it. We had uh, back in the day, you know, you'd go to your college bookstore and everybody would read in paper. You know, there was no digital copies of anything. And I have a huge book collection I've been collecting and you know, now they're all color coded. But <laughs> having that little red book and then having the little blue book. I don't know. I think it's just been, it was a small little quick read. I remember sitting in, in the botanical garden. It was a moment as my senior year. I was reflective, uh, appreciative, and it just has come with me wherever I've been. Cool. cool. So let's talk a little bit about your, your, your journey. Like, how did you go from the botanical gardens to writing a book and helping people think about what they should be doing to exit their business? There's about 25 years in between. My undergraduate focus was industrial and labor relations. And so translation, I went into human resource management with a global manufacturing company and was in a management training program for four years. It was great experience. And I realized that HR is a, is a good role, is a wonderful foundation to understand management of people and processes. Uh, I worked in a manufacturing facility, non-union, three shifts, and my customers were everybody from the welder painter, you know, up to the corner office. It was an excellent first experience. And I realized, well, HR is kind of on the sideline. I wanted to be more on the front line. I wanted to be in general management, decided to get my MBA. And that was a really big pivot. And my pivot went from HR in manufacturing to marketing in technology. And getting my MBA was the was a mechanism to do that. And ever since then, I've been on a trajectory of uh, on the growth side of, of of business creation, whether it's startups, whether it's large entities, and being involved in corporate startups. And I've been in different uh, industries from tech and logistics, transportation, software, education services professional services. And I've really enjoyed that. And one of the, the the key things that's tied all my experiences together is leaning in on growth and opportunity. I took a call from a recruiter back uh, several years, almost 10 years ago now. And he said, I have a CEO position available for someone with an e-commerce background. It's literally in your backyard. I thought of you and I think you should go for it. And that little voice inside my head was like, why is he calling me? I'm not qualified. You know, all the negative talk. And then lo and behold, yep. as, he, as he told me after, you know, six months of this process, I got the green jacket. So I got the job. It was a CEO position um, running about a hundred, hundred fifty million dollar revenue business. It was a subsidiary of a privately held company. Company is a three, third generation, 120 plus year old business. My boss was the chair per, the chair. Uh, of the company, he was third generation, and they said in the interview process, like this is a this is a long term, you know, this is a long term type of succession. We're looking for somebody for the next twenty years, not the next two, which was music to my ears. It was fantastic, so excited. And um, what ended up happening was I was there for three years, and the reason why we went through an acquisition process is a pretty big acquisition, a global, a global uh, transportation company. Uh, and so being one of the key executives with the others going through this process, understanding everything to keep, keep the lights on and run the business at the same time, go through this very, very confidential, because this is a publicly traded company. So everything had to be highly, highly confidential. Um, and learning the insides of, of, of that from, from our experience, going through the integration, uh, post-closing and what that felt like and looked like. And it just really got me uh, excited about this idea of mergers and acquisitions for privately held companies. I worked in private equity for a bit and was on the other side of the table and realized I'm a deal junkie. I really liked uh, finding buyers and sellers, bringing them together. And lo and behold, my marketing skills are applied in a big way. They're supplied in a different way. Instead of marketing a product or service, we are marketing your company. 
And it's a very strategic, very C-suite kind of a thing to do. And I just found that my skills uh, were very well positioned for that. Since I had been orbiting the C-suite for years, uh, I serve on boards and again, very comfortable in the boardroom environment. Um, and I think the other thing about it was I recognized, well, wait, you know, I, I would love to get a little more education. I got certified, didn't have to, but I chose to, to get certified and got the designation as a certified mergers and acquisitions advisor, uh, which has really honed my skills and kind of put it all together for me to add a ton of value for my clients. Hey, everyone. Walter Crosby, uh, your host of Sales and Cigars. I just want to give you a heads up that next month we're going to do a series of uh, episodes on prospecting. Uh, we're going to cover all of the basics, all the fundamentals, the things that uh, are going to help make your sales team be uh, consistent hunters. What are the prospecting tastic, tactics? What are the things that we know that work, right? So how do we get prepared to do this? I'm going to go through all of this in four episodes. Um, they're going to be just me. I'm going to be talking fast. I'm going to be talking about what, what we know works, what we know has worked uh, for a long time, and probably what your sales team isn't doing. So if you're a sales manager, if you're a salesperson, if you're a sales leader or a business owner who wants to help your sales team, these episodes will be short and to the point and they will be helpful. Go grab a cocktail, grab a cigar and tune in for those uh, upcoming episodes. Thank you. So That's a, a very robust story with lots of moving parts. Um, did, did you, as you navigated all of that and you, you, you worked your way to a, to a C-suite, how much, um, how much did you encounter sales and sales organization? And, and what was that when, when you're managing a whole organization, like how does, how does that position as a CEO of a, of a $150 million organization, how, how do you view the sales organization? Is it trouble? Yeah, we, yeah, absolutely. It was a really important part of the business. We had a very uh, comprehensive sales process because we had multiple lines of the business model. We had an inside sales team and then we had an outside sales team. Um, the inside sales team was more like, you know, kind of pick up the phone, uh, follow up with leads, email list, you know, a lot of volume. And they all had the desk, right? They each had their own desk and they all had their sales targets. There was a supervisor who oversaw that team. And then that rolled up to uh, someone else. Ultimately, there was a chief market or excuse me, chief sales officer who was responsible for um, the direct sales team and the indirect, the indirect team and uh, the strategy for that, as well as some other functions. So it was a pretty comprehensive group it by headcount absolutely was the largest group in the team and probably the most complicated too <laughs> but yeah it was a, a big part of the organization and they besides reporting numbers uh, at that point is there is there another metric that you looked at to make a connection between marketing inside and, and outside sales was there was there a metric that tied those three together? Um, well, I guess just to keep it simple, this business was about acquiring inventory and then selling inventory. So we had a team that would do uh, multi-year contract deals that involved operations. As, and so it was under the sales umbrella, but it was really, really a strategic sale, uh, not necessarily a transactional type of thing. Whereas the sales desks, those were only transactional to sell inventory, right? So we were market maker. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So, so, I mean, a diverse background and you, and you, I mean, where, where that landed was like, you're a, a, a deal junkie. You like that, the, the action, so to speak, but you like putting the pieces together and making sure there's a nice fit and everybody walks away winning and happy. Is that how it works? That's okay. ideal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every time I do one of these personality tests, the comes back, I'm a connector, I'm a builder, right? So my role at desk, desk, desk is my, is my clients are like all the contacts I have and all the connections we can build together. Let's make it a win-win. And what I mean by that is that we're looking to um, get the right fit buyer, you know? So there's tools at our disposal to try to do that research and have those connections to say, Hey, let's bring some of these buyers to the table. But ahead of that is the strategy. 
you know, why do we think that this, these characteristics would be best fit buyer? And then we can go from there. Is it a strategic? Well, what aspect of a strategic buyer? Is it a financial buyer? Well, there's different kinds of financial buyers. Or are we talking about a related buyer? Which again, there's different characteristics of a related buyer. Um, so it starts at this high level. We got to narrow it down. It takes uh, conver conversations. It's not a five minute conversation with the seller to understand, well, what is important to them? People time money, right? And so a lot of times we think, oh, it's the highest bidder that wins. On my podcast, I hear over and over and over that it isn't always the highest bidder that wins. It's the best fit. So we have to figure out strategy wise, what do we think is the best fit? You now, as we go along, we might change it. You know, the seller might change how they feel. They might think they're this is a non-negotiable, then eventually it is negotiable and that's okay. Um, but we have to have a starting point to work from. And so that's the strategic lens. It's super important. And I think for me and my executive experience, I've seen enough, right? I've been around the block and look around corners. That's part of my job is to help the seller because this is probably the only time that they're going to go through something like this, you know, mm -hmm. whereas I've been through, you know, so many of these now. And um, there's a lot of advisors out there who have sold their business and then they, they turn it into a practice, which is great. But again, they still only have one data point. Um, for me, I, I not only do the mergers and acquisitions work, I also do business transition advisory. So I understand the emotional side of this, as well as the practical transition transactional side. And I really emphasize in this conversation and every conversation I have, I do a lot of podcasts. I enjoy it so much um, to talk about the personal and emotional side, because it's so easy to kick the can on all of this. And believe me, the personal side can gets kicked <laughs> all the time. You know, with something that's tangible that we can understand numbers and calculations, you know, I like to say it's the head, the heart and the wallet. Right. And we got to get all of these things aligned. And that's a big message for for people listening who may find themselves in, in this uh, in this space one day, which if you're a business owner is 100 percent of you, by the way, <laughs> everybody is going to leave their company one day. Let's just pause on that. It's a true statement. Everyone will. But the other the other fact is that so few business owners prepare. And the other thing that I've heard time and time again is that owners wish that they had started the process sooner. And and when so, time is on your side, you can create more options. Yeah, the time always gives you options, uh, from, I guess, from that perspective. But so is there is there a niche? Uh, I, I want to try to help the people that, the, the, the listeners of the program to sort of self-identify um, as to that they might be a, a good fit um, for for your transition services or consulting and M and A work. What so is there is there a niche that you you like to 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 work in? Is there uh, a type of personality that you you like to work with? Because I, I really I want to explore that too. Where absolutely, that, yeah. Like well, our, we can take the like personality baby. side first, and then we can talk about some of the other characteristics. The number one thing, if someone's going to work with me one on one, is that they need to be coachable. They have to acknowledge that they are coachable and they're open minded. If they have all the answers already, then why do they need me, right? So mm -hmm. someone who is is a, a self. Uh, reflective, coachable person is curious. They are going to ask good questions. They are appreciative of new ideas. They want to see what they're not seeing and they want help and accountability. They want guidance and accountability. So those are some of the, the characteristics from a personality standpoint. The so when, you say, when you say accountability, though, Lori, you know, somebody that's run a business for a while, how do you help them? What does that accountability look like? Oh, is yeah, it, that's a that's a good question. I should clarify. Better? Yeah, it's they want to do this work. They know they're kicking the can. They want to do it. And so me working with them creates space to do it. And so what I mean by accountability is they are they want to hold themselves accountable to do this work. And what I do is I bring a process to the table, you know, you know, set the stage, right? We have, we have the meeting cadence, we have the agenda, and here's what we're going to work through in a, in a, over a period of time. And they really like that. 
they want to be told, hey, here's the stuff we need to work on. And I do with them. I do with you because I'll, I'll give you homework assignments. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, I'll, for example, like today, I spent an almost an hour going through an exercise that I call the skill fun box. And I could have assigned it to him to do on his own, but you know what? I wanted to do it with him. It builds trust and credibility in a new relationship, but also sometimes these things aren't obvious and I have to pull, you know, I, I'm a good listener, right? I'm a, 160, you know, probably at this point, 200 podcasts. And, you know, you learn to listen for things. That's the other thing that I, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed about podcasting is I'm a better listener by being on, being on your show and being on other shows too, and then having my show. And I use that skill in a new way with these clients because I'm looking for, for, for clues and cues and things that I can feed back to them. And they're like, oh, you know, you've put that together in a way I hadn't really thought of, but all, you know, it's like, it's like puzzle pieces. And, um, I really, I really enjoy that. It, it's, there's an element of sales where, we we should be listening more than we talk. I mean that if if we're if we're talking we're we're not in control. We should be listening, and it's and it's really if we're listening actively or we're listening well, then we are picking up the pieces and being able to connect those dots to help them see something that may have been right in front of them, but they have so many other perspectives. We we can help them see something that is obvious to us, but not obvious to them um, right. and connecting those dots. So that, that's a, um, it's a great skill. And talking to people and interviewing people is, is a, is a great way to listen because you're, you, you, you learn to listen because you need to pull that, pull some thread out throughout a conversation to, uh, you know, Johnny Carson used to do that, you know, years ago because right. he listened. Um, and he allowed the guests the space to talk. Um, not that I'm Johnny Carson, but in any way. <laughs> um, so, so you 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 work out the 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 emotional part of this, and and they're committed, and they know that they're kind of kicking the can around, and they they need somebody to help grab them by the arm and walk them down the path and point things out to them. That's um, right. And then the nuts and bolts, they're probably familiar with the nuts and bolts, but they're not familiar with what the way it needs to look to be able to position the company for uh, a transition, a sale or. I would say they're not familiar with the nuts and bolts. If okay. they've never gone through an M&A process, they've never sold a company, you know, they're or they're, you know, to to those people who are, let's say, you know, one to three years out. Um, if you're one, if you say you're one to three years out from selling your company, what that translates to for me is you really need to be starting the process now, like right now. If you say, um, I'm five to seven years out, we've got a little bit of time, but not a ton, right? Because things always take longer than you think in certain industries. It can take a year, maybe two, depending on, you know, the complexity and finding best fit. You can get an offer doesn't mean it's an offer you're going to accept. <laughs> so if a, if a seller decides not to accept an offer, you got to keep going, right? Um, sure. And then folks who say uh, 10 years out or longer, you know, they definitely don't feel the time pressure. Uh, I think that there's a, oh, well, the data supports it, that there are um, thousands and thousands and thousands of business owners who say they want to sell their business within the next five years. There's lots of surveys on this. And so five years is kind of a, a number that I'm using, you know, for that reason, it just resonates too. It sounds far enough out, but not too far out. Um, but, oh yeah, I mean, I get plenty of calls. I want to sell my business now. Can you sell it for me? And I said, well, tell me about it. And I just got a call yesterday and the guy said, um, he said, well, I'm a, I'm a little small. I don't know if you represent small companies. And I figured, well, let me hear him out. So he was under a million in revenue, well under a million in revenue. And I said, well, tell me a little more. Well, I, I'm in this industry. Okay. How many employees do you have? Well, just me. How old are you? I'm 62. I'm 65. Um, do you want to work with the, with the new owner or do you want to retire? I want to retire. I want to sell in two months and I want to retire. And I said, you know what? A good, a good luck to you. You know, this is probably, this is a great example of a company that's probably just going to close their doors because the buyer is going to look at that and say, what am I buying? Right. What am I buying? What is transferable? What is the value? There's price and there's value, right? 
price is what you pay, value is what you get. That's what Warren Buffett says. Um, so I, you know, respectfully said, we're not a fit for you. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think I didn't want to tell him, but ultimately that is not a sellable business. And yeah, in the lower middle market, you might see, be surprised to know that of the companies that have an intention to sell, a lot of them don't. And there's lots of reasons for that, but this is one good example of one that won't most likely. Do, do you work with family businesses where a, a second generation needs to transition into a leadership role or ownership role and the first generation is a little skeptical or there's multiple children involved like is that something you you get them get involved in from a transitioning I mean, from first maybe you know maybe i think many of the opportunities uh that i've where i've talked to folks kind of have a mix of some or all of those characteristics. Um, it can be first gen transitioning to second gen. In one case, it was second gen coming to me saying, hey, I really need help with my father. He will not leave the office. It's really becoming an issue with morale. And I put together a proposal to help with this. And he said, oh, I'd love to do it. We just we just can't, you know, for whatever reason. Um, in another case, it was a husband and wife. And um, they have three sons and they wanted me to kind of help, you know, help them come up with a, a strategy of evaluating the sons. And there, you know, there's the dynamic when you have to make choices or should they mm -hmm. sell to a third party? So we had some diagnostic tools that we used. And so it wasn't just opinion, right. And it was um, qualifying the process so that ultimately, you know, almost thinking about it being defensible within the family. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, another, you know, prospect I haven't spoken with yet, similar situation, husband, wife, three sons, and they're interested in, in, in coming up with a transition plan. Um, so yes, those are, those are what I, you know, kind of say are in the advisory. Um, most of my clients say, I, I have, a, I have an intention to transition in the future, you know, maybe within five years, I would like to understand how I can continue to build value or what measure what my value is today, understand what my value could be and talk about options to get there. And then also thinking strategically about the end game, you know, what's the end game and how do we get there? So the book that I wrote is all about that process. I call it strategic transition planning and it's essentially strategic planning, but for a very different lens, right? This is not for the operational side of the business. This is typically me with the owner 101. Um, when there's other partners involved and there's family involved, obviously it gets more complex. And I, I do get involved in those situations. And I also have other strategic partners that I might bring into the engagement because there could be tax complexities and legal complexities and all these things um, where I'll create and collaborate and pull together the right team, what I call the boat, the business owner advisory team, to make sure that we're all, you know, you know, it, doing what we need to be doing. It, every every business and every family is a snowflake. There are some common themes and pieces, but largely each one of these engagements, we have to figure out what is most important to work on and, and then go from there. So, I mean, you, you, from a business perspective, the, I, there's a lot of service companies that, um, that I've worked with over the years. And, the, you know, the, the visionary, right? Once they get a business up and rolling and it's starting to scale, the visionary, I, I see them get bored. Um, mm -hmm. they, they have stuff that they, they, they want to give, but, you know, their role in the company has been sort of, you know, compacted a bit. And, you know, the team is handling things and they're out mm -hmm. looking for ideas and trying to find acquisitions and things like that. And I think those people, um, the, they make a great um, podcaster, right? They, they have to have the commitment um, to go do the go do the episodes and be consistent about it. But I think those folks like that, that I think there's, there's more there. They have more to say than they think. They don't need to do two and a half hours. No. I mean, do a 20 minute podcast and add value to somebody and, and, you know, be on your way. So the mechanics of doing a podcast once a month, once a week, uh, what's, what's, what do you recommend? 
I, I recommend weekly. I, th- I think we're just programmed when it comes to entertainment to have, I mean, Netflix and Hulu are screwing that up, but older guys like me and you, that our shows came out on a weekly basis. We ha- it, you got daily, weekly, and monthly, what is a lifetime movie? Uh, so it, it, it's more that I think a weekly thing uh, it gets you out there. Now, every other week will work. It's just going to take twice as long to build your audience. You got to think every podcast you're putting out, everything you're doing is a chance to gain new subscribers, is to build things, is to have new content. So when you half those chances by doing them every two weeks, you're going to double the time it takes you to get to where you want to be. Uh, kind of with the new thing with, with short form marketing, stuff like that, you can kind of expedite that a little bit better. But if, if it's a weekly, you just bang it out, you get it done, you get it produced, you stay on schedule, you stay consistent. And that goes towards your brand too. It shows that you're doing a product, you're towards brand, you're, you're committed to it. So I think that speaks a lot to your volume, to your product as well of having that serialized commitment. Well, yeah, it does show a commitment, and yeah, and I, I, at the beginning, my goal was to have fun, talk to interesting people, and add value to whoever was crazy enough to pick, you know, pick up the episode and listen to mm-hmm. it. And, and and that's pretty much the, the same objective, right? I want to have a good time. I want to learn something, and I want to give some value to people, whether that's coming from me or a guest, um, or both, ideally that we're, we're, we're sharing thoughts that they can go put into action. Um, so that I, I think that, and it's a lot easier to get guests than people think. Mm-hmm. Am I, am I wrong there? No, it's, it's kind of the deal. What type of guest do you want? Now I'm going to talk about a negative and then we'll talk about a positive. The negative is everybody wants, everybody wants to either have a podcast or be on a podcast, like you said. So the pool of guests is massive. Uh, you, I, in 20 minutes, I could have a podcast this afternoon and have seven guests lined up for it. Are they quality guests? Are they the guests that you want? Are they the guests that further what your podcast is? I think that's the bigger question there. Uh, to, to When you're looking at podcast guests, guesting, being a guest, all of those things, make sure you're just matched up with the right show and you're adding value to that show uh, and you're adding value to the host and to each other. I've seen a lot of mismatched podcasts that people go on and it's not their gig or their thing. And I think that kind of hurts the host or the guest, but just make sure that they, they, they are competent to do what you want them to do and make sure that they, 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 um, they match your vibe. They match the thing that you're trying to do. And most of all pro tip out there is make sure they're willing to share your stuff. A big thing to get your podcast to grow is I hate it when a guest comes on, we have a great podcast. I put them on and they don't share it. We're, we're, we're trying to share those audiences. So, yeah. so those are all things to look for in guests. The, the, those are really good points. And I have, I, I look at it as a compromise. I, maybe do it a relationship, a weak moment to somebody I've had, I probably had four or five guests that like, eh, how was I thinking? Um, <laughs> right. You know, and sometimes it comes before the conversation. Sometimes it comes during the conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had one where I, there's only been one where I just said, all right, we're done. Cause you're just not cooperating and it, it just doesn't make any sense. And I, I literally didn't re- finish the recording and didn't I deleted everything? It, it was it didn't come back and haunt me, um, but it, <laughs> most of the time I can muscle through it. But yeah, damn, sometimes it's hard, and it's it, my it, fault because I didn't match it up, like you said. Now, my company and 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 everything involved, we've probably done a thousand episodes, so we've had a lot of things we could talk about, guests and stuff like that. We do a lot of, hey, that was great. We had a video problem. We put it on audio only. Like we, we've we done that before because we want to release it. We want to, no, dead serious. I'm giving a secret here. If, if we want to do it. And what's funny is that doesn't always happen. Like sometimes we do have video problems. It's a tech issue. And we do have to do audio only when we try to reschedule those. But if we just have a really bad guest, we want to honor that. We want to do whatever. It's like, hey, there was a video issue. We're going to release this in audio only. And then we just quietly squirt it out to one of the Spotify channels and be done. Um, the, the other thing is like, yeah, dead serious. One of the other things that, uh, like you said, I used to have a show, uh, called small business chronicles. And I, I, I started going through a PR firm getting authors on because I thought, man, I just want to talk to authors. I like books or whatever. I had to stop that because like 95% of authors would not talk about their books. I would ask them something. They'd go, blah, blah, blah. It's in the book. 
blah, 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 you know, because they're on just on there trying to sell books or whatever. So, so right. if you're an author and you're going on there, be willing to give away some of your book, be willing to talk about it. But, but that was, that was one of the things, like when you said yes, that was the only interview I ended because I told him it could be a two to three hour interview because we were doing it in parts. 20 minutes in, I went, all right, I got enough. And he's like, I thought it was, you know, and I'm like, no, no, I'm like, if you're not going to talk about the product, if you're not going to talk about your book, that, that, there's no point. That's, that. a, that's another really good pro tip for, for people in the audience is that mo- the professionals, you know, like, you know, I, I'd like to talk about this aspect of my book because I have mm-hmm. an offer that I can give people that's free for your audience. Yeah. Right. And, and that's awesome. Um, yeah. and, and I don't want them to give me the whole thing to the book. Right. But, you know, if they've got 13 points they're trying to make, let's talk about one of them and give them, give, give the audience a, a reason to go. They pick the, pick the one out of the 13 that think yeah. that is comfortable. Yeah, right. and, um, I mean, I have seven, I have a book with seven mistakes that CEOs make. And I'm like, Hey, you know, usually these two resonate with an audience. So mm-hmm. you, know, you pick yeah. Uh, yeah. and we, and we, and I give whatever I can give. I give away all the, pieces of it because then you want them to, to dive in a little bit so absolutely also, add value. It, uh, also if you have if you can give away all the value in your book in 30 minutes be a better writer <laughs> <laughs> there is that there, there is, is that. that there is that so, talk talk a little bit about like you know i want to have you on because um you know we're changing the format a little bit. We're changing the look and the feel of it. But uh, the also the I want to give you a chance to explain to people how you work and who who's a real ideal uh, customer for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the, the ideal customer for me, a hundred percent, is somebody that's ready to do it. Uh, is somebody that is ready to invest the time and energy. So as much as my podcast company does, it's still a lot of time and energy on the host side. My company does the thing to where we try to, you find your guest, you collaborate, you write your show, you find your vibe, and then we make that come alive. Um, so with people that are ready to work, wanna, uh, the, the clients that I like the least are the people that I, it's like pulling teeth to get things out of or, or, or to do those things. So if you want a successful podcast, number one, be ready to have a successful podcast because that's what we're here to do. Outside of that, a little backstory where I come from. Uh, I started podcasting in 2010 when I was a stand-up comedian. Then I got into marketing. Uh, I traveled down that marketing path for a long time, became director of marketing of an Inc. 5000 company, and decided that I w- kept podcasting, just hobbyish, you know. But I decided that I wanted to get out of the digital marketing space and do something more like this. So I got a couple partners, and we started the podcast company. Now, we look at podcasting as a marketing tool. Uh, so when we are looking at people, we're wanting people that want to expand their business, sell books, that they want a clear benefit from their podcast, that we look at it as a marketing, um, think about content. We all know with the birth of social media and YouTube and TikTok, content is king. And if you record, we were going back to that question. If you record 30 minutes of content every week, you now have two hours of content right? For an entire month that you can split up and you can send into newsletters, you can do into emails, you can sponsor your own show. If you're so inclined, 120 minutes of content is our 120 TikToks if you want to break it down that way. So, so people that are wanting to, to take their business, have a marketing tool that puts them face to face. Like I said, thought leaders, CEO, authors, all of those people, because we want a, that professionalism in the podcast. No offense to hobby podcasters out there, right? If you want to grab and you want to hop on Zoom and you want to do some podcasts and you want to do some things, that's great. That's that, that that's perfect. What our company does is we try to elevate that above those. Uh, we want to make sure that you have professional notes, that it's SEO'd, that you have uh, the background stuff done. As you can see, it's visually pleasant. It's edited well. Uh, and, and not only that, since I've been podcasting for years, we do a lot of coaching, equipment recommendations. It's really like a podcast production, editing, coaching, marketing company rolled into one. And, and we really strive to work with our clients to make sure that they have value out of it because who the hell has money to throw away on podcast unless it has some return, whether it be yeah. emotional or whether it be physical or whether it be financial. So we really strive to make sure we hit all of those markers as well. 
and, and I think that's true. And, you know, you know, we have, we try to have like a regular cadence, you and I to have conversations. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's a couple of things that came up today that we can talk about because I have a guest that we probably need to work that uh, some editing magic on. Um, uh, but um, I, I think if, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about it, Ryan's a guy you can call up and, and, you know, run your ideas past, have a conversation. It's kind of a no bullshit. He's going to help you. Uh, he wants, he wants to create podcasts, but he wants to create podcasts that are going to represent what represent him well represent yourself well right as well as elevate the 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 industry that's going to be a rewarding piece when somebody comes to you and like i have a window that's reasonable and i want to figure out where i am today and then what they can almost back into what they want to get out of the business if they do the right things along the way. I mean, that's that's the ideal scenario where they could position themselves to be acquired by somebody or position themselves to have a greater value to a buyer. Absolutely. Um, if we can measure your business today and baseline you, let's say the let's say the value of your business is is five hundred thousand dollars and we can determine uh, a roadmap if we are able to move the needle and on some intangible assets in the business, um, some financial performance and some other things. And what if we could literally double the enterprise value to a million dollars? That's probably the biggest ROI from a consultant or advisor you'll ever see, right? I mean, it's a huge, huge opportunity when you are measuring enterprise value. We're not talking about cost savings on shipping, right? We get excited right. about reducing shipping costs by 50%. Think about how many companies celebrate expense reduction, and that's a good thing to do. Don't get me wrong. But when you look at the impact of that expense reduction, plus impact of all these other things, and we rec and I do the math with people so they understand the math, hey, you know, dollar for dollar, um, what is it that will move the needle on enterprise value? And, and if they're a client of mine and we're doing valuation work, then we also get a head start at looking at the market from a buyer's perspective because we are looking at comp deals, you know, competitive comparative deals in their in their industry, and it informs us in a really, really, uh, you know, analytical as well as strategic way. So, I mean, a lot of moving parts for somebody to really think about, and if they could double or you know, it just. 50% increase of their valuation, you know, on today's, today's, um, uh, today's valuation to get it to where they want it to be, you know, cause you got other factors there, right? You know, inflation, the, the value of, of the dollar, just all of those components are all going to be part of this, but they might realize that they, that there's, they're not able to get to that level that they really want. So there might be some other strategy that, that they can work with. So, if, if somebody's if somebody has a business that is you know five to ten years out they should be looking at your book and reading through it and trying to understand the the process because as you said you could you're gonna exit your business it might just be you don't show up one day because you're done um, it might be you 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 know you sell it to your kids and ESOP or that you try to position it so that you get the greatest dollar out of it. So all of those, those things take time to evaluate. Your book is going to be a great place for them to start. Um, they can get your book. They can start listening to your podcast. Um, all of this is available on, on your website, correct? That's the best place? Yeah, my website is thebusinesstransitionsherpa.com. The book is there and I have the podcast called Succession Stories and a course that I've developed to serve entrepreneurs who uh, maybe are more budget conscious and really want to work on their self-guided time. But I've also coupled that with group advisory. So I'll still be with you on the way just in a group setting as opposed to one-on-one. So from a 
meeting my clients where they are. I'm really proud about this because that was a lot of the feedback. You know, not everybody has the budget, right? And so I appreciate that, especially women-owned businesses. Many, many of them are under $2 million in revenue, just statistically in the United States. And that's a segment that I care a lot about. And I want to be able to have uh, democratize access to my content. So I created the book, obviously, is affordable, but the course takes it to the next level. I am with you all the way on your journey. There's tools and video. I mean, it's so much, so much to learn. And, and but you know what? They got to put the work in. And so the group advisory is intended to help answer questions and 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 keep holding us accountable to the process. And yeah, absolutely. If people want to work with me one-on-one, I'd be so honored. Um, typically working with companies that are uh, five million million in revenue and up, um, but happy to talk to folks in the you know in the technical industry, professional technical services is uh, is an industry that I serve quite often. The, the um, you also have uh, readiness assessments on your on your website. So can you talk briefly about what what that what that deliverable is, or, or just help somebody really realize? I'm way, I'm screwed. I need a lot of help. (laughs) Well, for those, those of you out there who like the quantitative, just to kind of know where you stand, you'll really appreciate these. And there's no charge. uh, If you want to take them, they're on my site. There, there, there's one that will help you understand the value of your business and kind of a back of the envelope out of the box estimate of value you can get a good baseline. The data is really pretty good. I've tested it over and over. So, um, you, if you put in accurate financials for the last three years, you will all included in your custom report will be a list of the value drivers where you score versus your competition and aggregate on eight value drivers, a total score, and also an estimate of value. And then if you want to meet with me and I'll talk about scenario planning of how can we move the needle. Um, the other assessment is what's called a pre-score, which is personal readiness to exit. Again, very, very useful, very eye-opening. I use it with clients. Uh, you can get it right out of the gates. So you'll get your report emailed to you, but I use it with clients. We do a lot of planning with this tool because it it asks us questions we haven't really thought about. It gets us thinking about things, about the personal readiness side and what can make an exit that we don't, you know, doing an exit that we don't have regrets on later. I, I, th- those are really, I, I love the idea of, of, of a course that provides in a group setting that's led with you, uh, led by you, so that this like done with you model. Um, I, I do some of that with my business and it's a great sort of intermediary step to get people moving and get comfortable. And what, what's really cool is to watch people um, help each other, um, you know, sort of in that gestalt way of like, you know, I went through that piece and here's how we approached it. And we had this kind of an outcome, um, but having it led by somebody who, who knows what that looks like and where, where they're going, it really, that, that adds a lot of value for somebody who, is it, you know, maybe a smaller business. It's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm most excited about, you know, people getting access to the content earlier than they think they need it. And so if anyone's listening, thinking, oh, this isn't for me, I challenge you on that. You know, if even if you're a startup or you're a new company or you're a newpreneur, you just bought a company and you're new at this, you think you're perfect. <laughs> you are perfect to read the book and learn from it now while time's on your side. Yeah, it's one of the, the, the reason you you start a business is to figure out how to how to sell it after you made some money. So uh, I don't think you can. I don't think it's too early to start thinking about that because it makes you think about your business differently. It makes you think about like you're running a business, so there needs to be processes in place and what if scenarios are there. So I love that's it. right. Uh, is your business a job or is it an asset? And a lot of times it's a job for people. Right. It, it, and it that's okay. Out. But if you want your business to be an asset, there's things that you need to do. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to we have we have the website in there. We have all your social media in there. But I really encourage folks to go look at the, look at the website. And the bottom of the fold, there's a bunch of information that's available to, to help. And don't think you're too early. Um, so last question, Lori, uh, past or present, any relationship with cigars? There is a very interesting tradition in my 
two kids. They went to a, a private high school. And for whatever reason, when they graduate on the football field or wherever their graduation is that particular day, which is usually hopefully outside on the football field, um, after all the ceremonies and the students are, you know, hugging each other and the families are taking photos, someone is passing around cigars. I don't know where this started. It's hilarious. You literally see the kids you would never think to have a cigar in their mouth, and they do. And the pictures are great. It's a wonderful, fun tradition. And of course, parents end up taking them too. Um, so that's the one I think of. That's kind of cool. That, I, I, um, it is a celebratory thing in, in a lot of folks' minds. Um, but that's cool that it, it's cool that the school allows that to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Like I said, it's outside. I think if it's raining, I don't know if there is uh, there is appreciative of it. But uh. I was walking through a college campus at uh, I was out business meetings and I got up early to just go for a walk. And I was walking through um, the the road um, through through campus. Nobody's there. School's not going on, and um, it's six o'clock in the morning. And one of the little security guys came by and he's like, you know, you're not supposed to be smoking on, on property. And they're like, okay, good to know. I'm trying to get off property here. I'll be off and like, and he just kind of sat there and watched me to make sure I wasn't going to hang out in an empty uh, parking lot of a university. But, uh, <laughs> so that, that a little sensitive to schools, but that's a great story. Great tradition. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, Really, folks, if, if you own a business and there's most of the people in, that are listening to this podcast own a business, go grab the book. Go grab the you can get the book on the website as well. It's just a, a plethora of resources. So thank you. I really appreciate it. a lot of value for, for the audience. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.